Hello. Here we are. It is now um, Wednesday, February 13th at 12 o'clock noon Pacific Standard Time. And uh, I will be having special guest Charles Gandy join us today. We had a little bit of issue uh, connecting just a minute ago and he's restarting his computer. So I'm waiting for him to do that and then he will notify me and I will get, send him an invite again. I want to give you a little bit of background information about what we're doing here. This is a live stream where people can join in and ask questions in the chat. And then I can answer their questions or Charles can answer their questions. So in the chat over there, you can post, you can comment and talk to each other. That's fine. But you can also post questions for me or for Charles. If you're going to do that, please preface your question with the word QUESTION in all caps. That makes it easy for me to find. Um, we did a live stream interview with Charles last week and we had a lot of glitches. So we're doing it over this week, um, trying to solve that, but maybe we're having another glitch right now, so I don't really know yet. I'm going to send Charles an invite again in just a minute. I'm giving him a chance to reboot his computer. So last week, um, Charles, it was really fun because he talked about some of his design ideas and how he gets his ideas and the knitting contests that he's been in. He's also talked about uh, his experiences in the Master Hand Knitting Program. Both Charles and I are TKGA, that's the Knitting Guild Association, certified master hand knitters. And we both served on the master hand review committee once we completed our masters. We actually served on the committee of the people that reviewed the upcoming students who went through the program. So we learned a lot and we had the opportunity to do a lot of deconstructing and figuring things out and re-engineering what people have done. And that's the best way to learn. So let me invite him again. Let's see if he's, I'm going to call him on the phone and see if he's up and running yet. You'll be able to hear him. He's probably flustered. Your call has Whoops. been forwarded. Let me call the yarn store again. Sorry for the delay. It'll it'll work out. So you can chit chat with each other over in the side column there. Hey Suzanne. Hello. Are you on live? Yes. Did you get your I'm having a problem. I've got this some I've gotten a bug that's come into my computer and it's not letting me access anything. Uh oh. Uh, yeah, it's Can you do it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um if you know what it is, it's trying to you know, it's one of these um what do what do they call them? Um it, it's it's frozen my computer. Do you have a Mac? Time. Do you have a Mac? I have a Mac. Well, I don't think that happens. Do you turn it all the it way does. off? It does happen because it's a, it's, they've gotten into the way it's called an advanced Mac cleaner. Oh. And they're trying to get me to sign up for something that I don't need. Or want okay, so well, let's po to... let's postpone this till next week. Yeah, we'll have to because okay. I've got to get rid of this thing. So okay. I'm very sorry. Have, okay. Have you got stuff you can talk about? Yes, I'm good. So just tell people that, again, we've got more problems and more difficulties. Okay. But until I get rid of this thing it's not gonna let me access anything okay. that's why my cursor froze up they, so uh, i'm letting them hear you right now okay oh okay okay well i apologize okay so, that's okay uh, we'll do it okay. next week okay okay bye. okay sorry Take everybody care. okay bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. So the unexpected does happen and we're good because I am still prepared for that. Um, we're actually having a huge, huge windstorm here in Bakersfield today and some people are losing power. So far my power has been very good. So I'm not really concerned about that. But if I suddenly disappear, it's because the power went out. 
Okay, so um, Charles did have some books that he got out for me to share, and I'm going to do that first, and then he'll. I'm going to tell you what I like about them, and then next week when um, Charles is back on here, he'll tell you what he likes about them, okay? So the first one I'm going to show is called Sequence Knitting, and it's a big uh, coffee table style book, and this book is by Cecilia Campacciaro. And she's really a math expert. And what she has done is taken very small increments, very small multiples of patterns, and repeated them over and over to make very interesting textures of fabrics. I'll let Charles talk more about this uh, with you next week. It's a very large book, um, but it's very interesting. And it has influenced Charles. It hasn't influenced me so much, but I do like the book. And then he also likes the Ravel, the Raveled Sleeve by Catherine Lowe that I showed last week. That's also one of the books that he wants to talk about and how she influenced him. She is a couture knitter and um, she really likes to get into finessing and the very, very, very fine details of um, working on your knitting and making it look absolutely beautiful. Hand knitting, not machine knitting, but it looks like machine knitting. Then there's, of course, the Japanese Stitch Bible by Gail Romer and um, Hitomi Shida. It's actually, the patterns are by Hitomi Shida. She's Japanese, and she has put out a lot of Japanese patterns, but it's translated with an introduction by Gail Romer. If you've ever had a chance, Gail Romer does teach knitting classes at knitting conferences, and she teaches how to translate not how to learn Japanese, but how to use the Japanese charts, because the Japanese charts are very different from English or other charts. But once you learn how to read them, uh, they're very awesome. And Hitomi Shida, if you Google her, look her up or put her on um, Ravelry as a designer and see her designs. She is the most amazing designer and she uses knitting and crocheting together in the same garments to get whatever it is the desired effect that she wants. In these books, this is all knitting. It is not any crocheting, but the patterns are beautiful. And this is where I got the uh, part of the patterns that I used in my um, Aran sweater, my green Aran sweater that you've seen in some of my recent videos that I did the embroidery on through. Uh, she doesn't show the embroidery. That is from Anna Zilborg, but I used the base pattern from this book. And all of these books are good to use in the yoke cardigan that we're going to be starting real soon, the yoke pullover or cardigan, because you're going to be looking for pattern to plug into the yoke area. And you could even use something from sequence knitting to put in the yoke, something simple like that, that just creates a texture up to something really fancy like Hit Hitomi Shida's designs. Another standard book that everybody should have in their knitting library is Alice Starmore's Erin Knitting. And uh, it's just, you know, if you're working in the Master Hand Knitting Program, this book will become very valuable to you because in level three, you need to learn a lot about Erin Knitting. And Alice Starmore actually has done, I would say, the landmark research on Erin Knitting. You'll get the uh, true history of it in this book rather than the fairy tales. Then last but not least of Charles' recommendations is this pop knitting. And he'll tell you why he likes this. Um, it's a fun book. To re really think outside the box with this book. And this is by um, Britt Marie Christofferson. It's called Pop Knitting. And he'll talk more about that next week. So that kind of gives you a prelude of Charles. Uh, what he's going to talk about. He also is going to have some of his sweaters and his socks to discuss and also about his um, uh, tri tri trials and tribulations of going through the master hand knitting program. And that it's just a really fun story. So someone else asked me on Ravelry, you know, we've been knitting these starry, starry night socks as a knit along. These, this is the, the, the star version. And then this is one of the alternate patterns these haven't been blocked yet. I'm making a blocking video uh, with these, maybe today. And I'm gonna publish this as an independent pattern, this particular design. A lot of people have asked for that and it won't have all the tutorial stuff, but it'll have 
the all everything you need to know to knit these socks. So one thing uh, someone asked is they wanted to see the sole to see what it's supposed to look like because it can be confusing and I'll talk a little bit about that. The sole is really pretty. Here's the heel. Nothing special about the heel, but the way it's con excuse me, the way it's constructed is very very interesting. So on the charts, the way those look, this is how the heel looks. It's got these stripes here and the real heel as it turns out looks very much like that. Okay? That's what the this is what the chart looks like and this is what the heel looks like. A good representation. But the sole, the directions for the sole look very different. It looks speckledy, doesn't it? And I'll explain why, but on here you get stripes if you follow the directions. In the chart, if you follow the chart, what you're getting are stripes. The reason you get the speckled pattern here, that the stripes are broken up, is because every time you make an increase here, it moves all these stitches over one square. So it, what would have been a line gets broken up and moved over one square, but the line actually continues. It does not make a speckled sole. And that can be confusing to some people. Just trust the chart work the chart and this is how it should look. Okay, so today um, was very fun day. I actually made the video for the uh, how to measure your body for the next um, knit along that we're doing, the I tag yoke. So I got that all done this morning and in that cardigan and sweat or pullover, I'm gonna give you much more information about bust shaping, different ways to do bust shaping. I gave you one way in the uh, iTag uh, cardigan tutorial. It takes a guild uh, cardigan tutorial. I gave you one way of doing bust shaping. There are other ways of doing bust shaping. I gave that one at that point because it is the simplest one to do. And because in the pre preliminary preparation, we did not talk much about bust points and where your breasts are in relationship to the rest of your chest and all that kind of stuff. This time in the measuring video, I am covering all of that. So we will talk more about different ways of doing bust shaping. And also we'll get into more detail in the waist shaping and there will be the pockets. So you can put in a pockets in the cardigan or you can put in a kangaroo style using my pocket design, but it would be the a kangaroo style pocket across the front of a pullover. Okay, so let's see here. Let me answer some of the questions that people have asked on Ravelry. Here's a question, and this is this says for a yoke, I want for the yoke I want to make short sleeve lace top with a slightly scooped neck. Will that neck will that neck work with the yoke? Yes. And I'm going to talk about that. In fact, um, the yoke is really interesting because if you, from the part that is from here, from the tips of your shoulders around like this, this part of the yoke is actually a circle. And you can use the same mathematical calculations that you use to make a pie shawl. So, and I'm going to talk all about that in the, in the preliminary part of the tutorial. So if you take a pie shawl, and instead of starting in the center and working out, you're gonna start with a head opening, right? And then work out. So I'm gonna tell you how to figure that out. Then some people want their head opening bigger or smaller, depends on whether you want your neck to be up like this, or you want your neck maybe to be out like this, or even out, you know, the shoulders way out and the front coming down more. I'll talk to you about how to adjust that. We're also going to go over short row shaping, for the back neck to bring the back neck and why would you want to do that? What types of bodies does that work best on? It doesn't work for everybody. There's a certain set a group of people that it works really good on and I'll talk about that. Um, and then we'll go into the yoke and talk about the different types of design elements that you can put in there, how you would adjust. For example, I'm working, this is my swatch one of the patterns I'm trying. I have been working on multiple different ones. So this is my swatch. I have um, like 130 stitches cast on here, knit in the round because I'm going to knit my sweater in the round and I'm gonna steak it. These this is, are my steak stitches right here. Um, 
I'm going to put a steak in and cut it down the front and so it will be a cardigan. So it would be knit top down. This is not how the design is going to be, but I wanted to test out my design because what I want to see is, is there a difference between my stitch gauge in plain stockinette versus my stitch gauge in the stranded knitting? Now this has not been blocked yet. Of course I'm knitting this way, but I would wear it this way. So once I, and I've got probably about that much more I'm going to knit. I hope to finish it today. Then I'll block it and um, I'll make a video of cutting the steak, preparing the steak and cutting it and all of that's part of the education of the tutorial. Not everybody has to do a steak. Don't be thinking that, okay? But if you want to learn about steaking, this is a great opportunity to do that. So I need to make sure, now what if my, what if my stranded knitting pulled in, which is usually the case, you know, usually stranded knitting stitches are square and regular stockinette stitches are rectangular. They're wider than they are tall, but oftentimes stranded stitches are square. They're the same width as they are tall. And it's not that they get um, taller, they actually get narrower. Usually stranded knitting pulls in because of all the floats on the wrong side of the work that will cause the stitches to pull in. So I'm being very, very aware of my floats and trying to see if I can maintain the same stitch gauge with the stranded knitting as I do in the stockinette. Now, what if my stitch gauge were different? What if it did pull in? What would I want to do? There's two options. One is I can either go up a needle size for the stranded portion or I can add stitches, right? So, and in the yoke, it's not hard to add stitches because you're going to be adding stitches anyway. So you would just add some extra stitches to compensate for your gauge change in the stranded work. And the same applies to cables, lace, or mosaic knitting, any other design elements. And I'm going to cover all of those that you want to put in the yoke. You still need to check your gauge between your design element and your stockinette stitch that's going to be on the rest of the sweater. And I'll teach you how to make those changes. I'm really kind of getting excited about this. So when I started the last uh, tutorial, which I sent out the final version um, yesterday, there'll be no more unless somebody finds major errors in it, and then I'll just be making corrections. But I think it's done. Um, this tutorial, I learned a lot from the last one. There's going to be a couple things different. One, I'm going to put in a table of contents, and it'll be right at the beginning. So you'll be able to easily go through and find where you want to be and I will mark the things that are optional versus non-optional and all that kind of stuff, just like we did last time. For those people who did not do the last sweater with me, I'm still going to cover all the basic information and uh, so you won't be behind or anything. For those who, are, who did the last tutorial and do this one, oftentimes when you read the same thing a second time, or you work it a second time, you have some aha moments. And I'm hoping that happens for you. You'll go, oh, that's why I'm doing that. Instead of just following the directions blindly, you'll start figuring out why you're doing what you're doing. So you can use that information for your all your knitting forever after. So let me see if there's any more questions here. We'll cover all those, and then I'll go to the questions that you're having in your chat over here, okay? This one's for Charles. Charles. And okay, this is from v Vivens, Vivens Lee Key. Vivens like she says she liked the Sunday live stream, and um, she mentioned that I shared a book, and a question came to mind: Is Shirley Patton's Knitwear Design Workshop a companion, a comparison to Catherine Lowe's The Raveled Sleeve? Are they both library worthy in your opinion or is one preferred over the other? Your thoughts, please. The Catherine Lowe book really is for those who, where is it? It's down here. The Catherine Lowe book is really for those who are really anal, like me, okay? If you don't wanna know all those itty bitty 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 details, this is not the book for you. You can pass it up. To some people, this is really boring. It's like reading a chemistry book. But to me, who liked chemistry, this is bedtime reading. So it depends on what kind of person you are, whether you would like to have this in your library or not. It is not for everybody. Now, Shirley Patton's book, 
over here, I'm not going to go into details about it today because I have a whole bunch of designing workshop books and I am going to go through all of them in time and tell you what I like and what I don't like about them and which ones. But yes, this is a good one to have in your library, but I wouldn't buy it quite yet. So in the next live streams, as we're constructing this new sweater, I'm going to be showing you some of these sweater workshop type or sweater construction books that I have because I have a lot. Here's Designing Knitwear by Deborah Newton. There's Sweater 101. That's a really old book, but it's really good. You know, I have a lot of stuff like that and I can bring those out and show them to you over time and then you can decide which ones you want to have. Okay. So I think that's all the questions I have here. Oh, this was Fuge, and I showed the sole of the sock, so that was her question. Let me get rid of these. Now let me go over here. I have a separate computer down here so I can look at the chat. I'm going to go through the chat and see and answer some of your questions from over here, okay? You should try this. Um, having two computers open, two separate keyboards, two mouse pads. Which mouse pad goes to which one? So uh, bear with me, but I think we'll be just fine. So, and remember, put question in capital, capital um, letters. And I want to tell you, Anne Tremilliers, she says, hello, Suzanne and Charles. Um, thank you. Anne has been um, doing translations on the subtitles for my videos. Isn't that awesome? So many of them are in French now. Every week she sends me a couple more, and I approve them and put them up. So, um, Thank you, Anne. Thank you, thank you. And especially thank Francoise, because Francoise did the translation for the It Takes a Guild tutorial, and she's going to be translating the ITAG yoke, too. Thank you, Francoise. And she helps me so much. She has an eagle eye. She finds the littlest details and helps me correct them, which I really, really appreciate. Okay. I'm so sorry Charles can't be on here, but don't, don't just get distressed. He will be. He's just having a little glitch today. Okay. Oh, here somebody said, oh, Grammy Lulu, Lily said, Suzanne is always prepared. Were you a Girl Scout when you were little? I was, you know, always be prepared. So I'm always, I always have a backup system. And I've taught a lot of classes live. So um, I can fill in. <laughs> I'm really good at filling in. Okay, and good afternoon to everybody that's on here. It's so good to see everybody. Thank you. Okay, this is Michelle Lindgren. Question, Suzanne, will you please give a brief expl explanation of how to weave in ends on the stranded knitting? Weaving in ends on stranded knitting is um, sometimes difficult. It depends on the yarn that you're using. If you're using a woolen spun yarn all you have to do is on the inside of your knitting and wool and spun non superwash like shetland or jameson's and smith jameson's or jameson's and smith shetland wools you just take a strand your your tail and you weave it you can just go up and down let me get a needle here i do have one here So you just would take your needle and you would go, you would find a float and you could weave it around the float. So you see this float here? You would just go under it and under it and weave and do a couple, okay? Oh, Charles, let me try Charles again. He might be ready. Thank you, Cindy. Cindy just sent me a message. Okay, let me invite Charles again. Where? Oops, wrong keyboard. Okay, I sent him an invite. Let's see if he can connect. That would be very cool. Let me check my text messages and see 
He hasn't. Okay, so Cindy texted me. Thank you, Cindy, your lifesaver. So we'll see if Charles gets that and gets on here. And I can try calling him again, too. So where was I? I was answering somebody's question. Oh, the weaving in of the ends. So if you're working with Shetland wool, non-superwash wool that has been wool and spun, that means it's real light and airy and loosely spun, um, you can just weave under some of the tails and it will hold because it'll actually felt down. It won't come out. If you're using superwash wool like this is, actually what you're going to need to do is find some stitches underneath the floats and weave in a little bit of duplicate stitch. It's not so easy, um, but you can do it. In this area, like in the stripes here, it's real easy. You could just weave in and out some of those stripe stitches, okay? Does that answer your question, Michelle? Okay, this is Deborah Cisneros. She says, what is the still board? You mentioned the embroidery on your green sweater. The still board. I don't know what you mean by that. Can maybe rephrase that question, Deborah? Maybe I was um, mistalking. I'm not sure. Vera Van Slyke, question. How do you calculate the number of additional stitches needed for the steel? For the steek? Okay, a steek... There's lots of ways to do a steek, and I will be talking about that in the tutorial. This particular steek, I put seven stitches, and I like to have an odd number because of the way I prepare the steek. So you could do seven or nine. It depends on the size of the yarn you're using and how many steek stitches you want to have to secure your stitches and what type of wool you're working with. And I will talk a lot about that in the tutorial. But this is my steak. You can make it lines or you can make it a checkerboard. I prefer lines because the way I prepare my steak before cutting it, it's easier to see the lines. Checkerboard's actually prettier on the finished project. It looks very, very cool, but it's really hard to see which is your center column because it keeps changing color back and forth. So when you're working with really small stitches like this, I'm using a size three needle and this is fingering weight yarn. It's easier to see the, the center stripe to work with. Um, so there'll be lots more information. And I have one really horrible video on steaking. It's really pretty to watch it. You should check it out. Uh, search my channel for steaking. You'll see it. But I didn't realize at the time and actually for quite some time later, my camera had a crack in the lens. And so everything is very psychedelic looking. It actually is really pretty. Um, uh, from an artistic stand of point, uh, point of view, but um, as far as learning from knitting, it's not so great. So I'll be making um, more videos on the steaking as we come to it. Okay, Charles, I may have the issues fixed if you want to try it again. I did try it again. Charles, let me call him up. Charles! I've got him on speaker. Let's see if he answers. Okay, let me call the yarn store. Sorry for this, but if we can get him on here, it's worth it. When the wind blows like this, my allergies kick in big time. Hey, Suzanne. Hello, Charles. I, have I you... thought I had it worked out, but I don't. So okay. uh, we'll just have to do it again. I'm so sorry. Okay, no problem. We'll do it next week. Okay, okay. thanks. Okay, bye-bye. Right. Bye. Okay, so we'll just keep moving ahead here. We're good. So let's see the next question here. Judy Kruger. Question, if on the next knit along, can you use variegated yarn for a cardigan and not do color work? Yes. You do not have to do color work. I don't want you to think that because I'm doing color work that you have to do color work. You can do textured. You can just do knits and pearls. You can do um, cables. You can just do, you know, my uh, yellow and gold reddish sweater that I wore last time. That is just columns of ribbing, like a starburst, like a sunburst. You could do that. And I'll show how to do that. In the preliminary part and in the beginning, the first week or so, I'm going to give you from very basic stitch patterns that will create a design 
to very complex. And for those who are adventurous, you can choose any design you want and I will help you figure out how to make it fit. So don't feel uh, that you have to be uh, an advanced knitter, a very beginning knitter. If you can make knits and pearls and you can knit in the round, you can knit this sweater. It's not hard. And you can knit it in any size yarn from fingering to bulky and for any size body from baby to very big bulky man. Okay. Okay, so let's see. Let me see some more questions here. Kathy Mashburn, she says, she jumped up. Let me find her. On your swatch for the yoke sweater, the yellow yarn you mentioned in class last night that it was hand dyed, will you need to adjust for possible pooling effects? Yes. Th thank you, Kathy, for mentioning that. Can you see the pooling in this? Do you see that? It's not a reflection. That's how the yarn looks. This is... Um, Aracania Huasco. It is a hand dyed yarn and you see the pooling. So now on, I'm not rotating skeins here on this particular one because I'm just knitting a swatch for gauge. But if I were knitting my sweater, um, that pooling actually looked really pretty cool. But when I change from skein to skein, the pooling will change and the, the uh, percentage of light to dark might also change and it may create a line where I start a new skein. So I use two skeins at once and I will tell you all about that. In fact, that would be a really good video for me to make. So I start my sweater. This is gonna start from the neck and go down and I would work until I've used about half of the first skein of my main yarn. Once I've used half, I start blending in the second skein. So then I will use the second half of the first skein and the first half of the second skein. The first skein runs out. I start the third skein. So I'm using the first half of the third skein with the second half of the second skein. So I'm constantly overlapping my skeins and it blends the whole thing together. You'll still get pooling uh, because it's unavoidable and it'll still be really, really beautiful. In a yoked sweater, the pooling will change. You'll get some a certain kind of pooling here because you have more stitches and then the pooling will change right below the yoke and be different for the rest of the body because the stitch count will be different. There may be a freak accident that it actually stays the same between the two, but most likely the pooling will change between the yoke and the body, but that looks very, very interesting and beautiful. And that's one of the things that I love about hand dyed yarn is that pooling effect. So you can use it um, as an um, attribute. Okay, that was Kathy. Nancy Drake, question. Charles has sent a note that, oh, okay, we got that. Didn't work. Well, I'll work with him outside, and then we'll get it ready for next week. Kathy Mashburn, Lillian Rojas, I tag short for it takes a guild. Yes, I, I T A G is the uh, acronym for it takes a guild. And so all of my tutorials from this time forward are going to be I tag and then it'll be yoke. And then I think we're doing I tag Aaron and then I tag set in sleeves. That's the sequence that I'm going to do them. And I'll do about two a year. So we did the one in the fall that was the raglan. This is the one for the spring. It's going to be the yoke. Next fall, we'll start the Aaron and next spring, we'll do the set in sleeves. And if you follow along through all of them, by the time you finish that, you should be able to design your own sweaters from any yarn for any size body and be able to do all of that. Okay. Uh, it just frees up your mind. This is how people used to knit before patterns were written down. They started by a gauge swatch. This is my gauge swatch. And it's a big because, see, once I cut that steep cope on, this is going to be like this wide and it'll be about this long. But I'll get very, very accurate information from this and my sweater will fit. Okay. So let me go down here. Uh, Vera Vance likes us. Thanks for the book reviews. Very helpful. Now I want Catherine Lowe's book. I think you might like it. You know, you have to be that kind of person that likes the little itty bitty details. Okay. Anne Tremolier's question. I would like to find a chart of a cable dividing in two cables for my underbust. 
Do you know where I could find one? Y you want one that goes sideways, right? Is that, I think that from your drawing that you made, you want to have a, let me turn my screen down a little bit. You want to have a cable that goes this way. You want to knit down and then you want a cable that goes this way and then you're going to knit down from that. You can do that. Or you can find some cables that are knit this way, going down, that look like they're going this way. And I'll show you a source for that. It is in the Celtic Knitting Book by Viking Patterns for Knitting by Elizabeth LeVold. And there are other books. Whoops. I threw it on the floor. There's other books similar to this, uh, but this is one of the first ones that I got. This is Viking Patterns for Knitting by Elsbeth Levold. And she has, and look at, see how many places I've marked in here? See all my, a bunch of them that I've liked in here. Let's see what they are. Ah, see? You can start and stop a cable mid fabric. And then it, it can go, looks like it can go in either direction. Do you see that? It could be going this way, knitted this way, or it could be knitted this way. This particular one is, is going in this direction, but see, it looks the same either way. Do you see that? That's very cool. I wrote a whole article in Cast On Magazine about starting and stopping cables mid fabric. Here's another one. This one's really pretty. See, it's knit uh, this way. It's knit going back and forth like this. But it looks like it could go this way, doesn't it? So this is the type of thing that you could use in your underbust area. Not this particular one. It's too big. But you could do something very, she calls them horizontal zigzags. Okay. Let's see what else I've marked. Here's another one. Do you see how it starts here and stops here mid fabric, but the center of the cable is going all the way through. This man, these must have been the references that I used for that article or some of them. Here's some more where they start and stop mid fabric. And they could go this way too, see? Isn't that cool? And does that help you? I think that might help you. Think a little bit differently about how you want to do that cable under there. Okay. Sandra Morin wants to know question. The yellow in the sweater does Ron carry and what is the name? It's Arakania Hawasco and he does not have that color. It's an old color. I'm sorry. It's yarn that I had in my stash. He does have this red yarn though. That is Malabrigo uh, sock. Okay. But the yellow has been in my stash for a long time, and I absolutely love it. And, and I bought enough for a sweater a long time ago, and I'm going to finally use it. Okay. Vanita Tail, question. I'm making a second eye tag raglan sweater with shawl collar and zipper below shawl collar. Should I still plan for a three-inch button band, or can I do one half or one button? Uh, I would do one and a half inch. So it, when you're finished and the two sides come together with the zipper down the center, that it'll be three inches wide. So you could do one and a half, one and a quarter. If you're the kind of people person that likes the zipper teeth to show, I would do one and a quarter on each side. If you like the zipper teeth to be covered up completely, I would do one and a half inch on each side. Okay, because the sweater is intended for a three inch button band and all the other calculations are based upon a three inch button band. If we had planned for a two inch button band, then you could do an inch on either side. Okay, and I'm so glad you're making a second one. How fun. Marionette Paulison, question, after having watched your video on creating a double-sided pickup, I would like to know in what order I should start this method on the button band shawl collar for the iTech. I would start exactly like in that video. That would do the right side. Okay, this is, you know how to tell which side is which on a sweater? It's as you're wearing it. So this is my right hand. So this is the right side of my sweater, the right side front side, the outside of the front. It gets very confusing when you're talking about right side row, wrong side row, and the right versus left. Okay, we have right side versus wrong side. We also have right side versus left side. This is the right side of the sweater. The directions in that video and in the handout start with starting at the bottom of the right, coming up, 
And in this part right here, right below your collar where it's going to turn back, you would start the double pickup. You can start it and stop it anytime. You don't have to like do the whole thing that way. If you want to do the whole button band with the double pickup, you can. It's fine. You could do the whole thing with the double pickup if you want. Okay, let's see here. Anna Zilberg, what did I say? Did I say something else? Anna Zilberg is the book. Yes. Charles, everybody loves you and they will wait to see you next week. It's going to be okay. Don't stress out about it, okay? We're going to I'm going to do this for a long time. So if it didn't work this week, it'll work next week. We're going to be fine, okay? And Grammy Lily, she said she was a Girl Scout. Didn't you love Girl Scouts? I did. I like to be an adult Girl Scout. Okay, this is Judy Kruger. Question, using hand-dyed yarn, using all the different balls, will you have a lot more weaving in? Yes, that's a good a point, unless you want to spit splice or splice without spitting. I don't spit on mine. I, I call it a spit splice, but I just splice. And when I finish one ball, I splice another one right on and continue knitting. Or you can weave in ends. And I don't save the ends to start and stop on the edges. I just weave them in wherever it is that I'm working. Unless I'm working in lace. Lace is, you know, you need to start and stop in some area where there's enough stitches to weave in the ends without avoiding the holes. Um, I have videos on that. I have a video on, on the splicing. And you can see that when I did my... Uh, it takes a guild cardigan with all of it had all those intarsia, intarsia cables. There were lots of ends and I did not have any left to weave in because I spliced them all as I went. And splicing gets better with practice. You can splice just about any yarn. Um, and I have tried to splice acrylic and gotten it to work. So it just takes practice. OK, and, and, you know, I don't mind weaving in ends to tell you the truth, because once you learn how to weave them in correctly, uh, they look so nice that you actually take pride in doing it, and it's more fun. I do have a lot of videos on weaving in ends. I have a huge, huge video library on just about everything that you can imagine. You just have to learn how to search my videos. I actually have, I actually uh, have a video on how to use my YouTube channel, but I haven't published it yet. I need to do the voiceover. That's it's in my bullet journal of things to do. So one day I'll do that because it tells you how to search, how to use my playlists, how to find what you're looking for. Okay. Okay. Pamela Matthews. For the iTag zipper, I've already done 1.5 inches of knit one, purl one. Could I do three rows of reversed and then put it? Yes, that's a great, great solution. The zipper, the thing about the zipper is... Um, you can use knit two, purl two, or knit one, purl one ribbing and have a zipper. You can do that. To tell you the truth, I prefer to put the zippers in on the sewing machine. And it doesn't look good to use the sewing machine on knit one, purl one, or knit two, purl two ribbing. You would have to do it by hand. So if you have an edge that has a garter design or um a change between knits and purls like seed stitch or moss stitch, you can hide your seam. You can stitch in the ditch. Do you remember that? you stitching in the ditch on the sewing machine. You sew between the knits and the purls in the line between, and then your sewing machine, it goes down into the fabric and does not compromise any of your knits or purl stitches and is virtually invisible. If you have stockinette, fabric here let's say your zipper is coming down here like this the zipper if you have a couple rows of stockinette of course they're going to curl up and it will expose the zipper it will not look good but if you have a couple of rows of reverse stockinette they will curl down and hide the zipper so just think about how does the fabric react you know stockinette curls up on the top and bottom it curls back on the edges but this will be uh, bind off it'll curl forward right but if you do just even two rows of reverse stockinette stitch it will cause it to curl back and therefore it'll curl towards the zipper and I actually meet the fabric in the middle I personally don't like seeing the zipper teeth but it's personal preference you can do whatever you want it's your sweater 
I like the fabric to meet in the middle and that's from my sewing. Um, and even some, some sewers like showing the zipper teeth. I don't, I like to cover up the zipper teeth, but I, I was trained to sew, you know, in the fifties and sixties and sewing is different now than it was then. Remember home ec class? Remember we made those aprons, pot holders, or well, you start pot holders, then we made the aprons and everything with gathering. And um, so if you do, a, Pamela is correct. If you do a couple rows of reverse stockinette before you uh, bind off and bind off pearl wise, bind off so it turns to the back, okay? So it continues that curling under and it'll hide the zipper better. Okay, Dolise, I've got no less than 20 books by Elspeth Levold. Okay, let's see, what time is it? It's 12, okay, we're doing good. I have my mammogram today. Everybody else do their health maintenance. I have a mammogram at 145. Okay. Okay, Nature Crafts, do you use the yarn from your swatch in your actual project? Okay, here's my swatch. This is the yarn I'm going to use in my project. But I'm not going to take my swatch out. So I always buy at least 100 grams extra for any sweater project just for swatching. That way I can swatch to my heart's content and not worry about using my sweater yarn. I do not rip these out and reuse the yarn. But you can if you want to. So if you did rip this out, that means you need to recondition it. You need to reskein it soak it in water you know and let the kinks come out hang it let the kinks come out let it dry completely and put it back into a ball you i would not re-knit with yarn that has been blocked or even that's been in in a project for a while because it will it takes on the yarn takes on the shape of the stitches you know it looks like top ramen before you cook it and you don't want to knit with that. It will change your gauge. And that's one of the things. In fact, I'm going to write that down. In my video to-do list, this is what I've wanted to do for a long time. It's a good, be a good blog post. Compare used versus unused yarn in a gauge swatch. I've done it in a project. In fact, for a sweater that I no longer have, it's one I knitted for Cast On Magazine, um, I got desperate. I was behind time as usual, and it actually has my pockets in it from the bottom up. That's the one that I published with the pockets bottom up. And if anybody wants a copy of that, if you send me your email address, I'll send you a copy. Now it's not written out for any size yarn and any gauge. I think it's specifically for five stitches to the inch, but you'll get the concept of the pockets, okay? If you use them, you have to give me credit because it is my personal design. I don't think anyone else has done these pockets besides me, they're a special, way of putting them together and they're deep they're diagonal and deep at the same time but anyway i was knitting that sweater and i needed to rip part of it out and re-knit it because i made a boo-boo i had to knit set, take out several inches and i was way behind time so i didn't re-block the yarn i didn't recondition the yarn and i continued knitting and then i blocked the whole sweater and you can definitely see or at least i can definitely see the area of the yarn that was knitted the second time it made a big difference visually uh, on what the stitches look like. So I learned a lesson and I, I turned it in, sent it in, they used it and everything was fine. You know, they didn't notice it and the pictures look great, but um, I learned a lesson that way. I do not reuse yarn without reconditioning it first. Okay, let me go down here some more questions. These have all been really, really, you guys are good. You're asking some really good questions. Okay. Francois, question for your yoke sweater. You said you'll use Malabrigo sock yarn. What size of needles are you going to use for this yarn in stockinette stitch? I'm going to use a US 3, which is in millimeters, is 3.25 millimeters. That's what this, uh, these needles are 3.25 millimeters. This is sock yarn here. This is fingering weight yarn. And it looks pretty good. This hasn't been blocked or anything. And this is where I've been catching floats behind there. Do you see that? 
worm cage. And I'll show you how to catch the floats so that they're not visible. They don't see that's red yarn behind there. See the red yarn? But you don't see the red yarn coming through from the floats. And so I'll show you how to do that without distorting your fabric, okay? Actually, I already have videos on that if you want to look at them. Okay, that was a good question. <laughs> Champ Smith says, Suzanne, you're our scout leader for our intensive knitting badge. Yes, we need to get a, a, a green uh, sash and we can put our, our knitting badges on it. Wouldn't that be fun? Very cool. I love that. Okay, this is a good one here. This says, this is from Diane Villiers. Question, when will directions for the hood go up and how will I find them? The hood went up. I sent it out yesterday. So look in your Ravelry library. It should be there. And I gave three different versions of how to do a hood. <laughs> Nature Craft says, I was supposed to sew Bermuda shorts in home ec. My mom ended up having to do it. <laughs> We weren't allowed to wear shorts to school. When I went to high school, you had to wear a dress or a skirt. And when you knelt down on the floor on your knees, the dress had to touch the floor. The skirt had to touch the floor. One day a year, we could wear culottes. But we never got to wear pants. And the year after I graduated, they changed the rules in the United States and said girls could start wearing pants to school. Isn't that ridiculous? Okay. Question. This is Grammy Luli. All, of all the sweaters that you teach, which one would you suggest for a first sweater? I think this yoke sweater is good for a first sweater. The raglan one was too, but the yoke one is uh, even easier than the raglan. So the raglan one was really good for beginning a sweater knitting, but because of the raglan and figuring out your um, stitch, you know, the increases difference if your arms were different size than your bust and stuff. That's kind of complicated. The yoke doing that, it's much easier to do that. So with the yoke sweater, I can throw in other elements that are complex, but don't overwhelm you too much. So I'm going to add a lot more information about bust shaping, a lot more information about waist shaping, than we had last time. I'll be throwing that in there and raising the back neck up with short rows. Okay. <laughs> Anne says, Suzanne has a very good video on reclaiming swatch yarn. It's on the iTag playlist. And I'll probably put that in this new playlist as well. And Cindy said, she's right. Ask me how I know using uh, not reclaiming your yarn before you use it. <laughs> Debbie says, Snaros, culottes. Yeah, remember culottes? Oh my God, and you remember pants that zipped up the side? We didn't have pants that zipped up the front. They, they zipped up the side. They were called hip huggers. Okay, Mary Inman, question. If you use superwash sock yarn, do you have to machine stitching to reinforce force when sticking? Um... You might, but I'm going to I'm going to reinforce mine by hand and I'll, I'll make a video. You'll see it. It depends on the weight of the yarn that you're using. For example, if you're using worsted weight superwash uh, yarn, I would machine reinforce and I'll show you how to do that. I'll, I'll do a video on that. It's really cool. I knit a sweater for my husband that I knit the whole out of worsted weight yarn. I knit the whole thing up to here as a tube with a steak for each arm. And it's not stranded, it's just one color and it's just all stockinette, it didn't have any stitch design, just a plain stockinette sweater stitched up to here in a tube. I, I um, didn't create special areas for steaking, I just allowed stitches for the steak. You know, the steak is not the cutting. The steak are the stitches where you're going to cut. So I just had st stockinette steak and then I reinforced with the sewing machine, cut it down, and he wears it all the time. And that one's been through the washer and dryer uh, quite a few times, and the stick has never uh, never fallen apart. So uh, I'll show the machine sewing and the hand sewing one in the videos in, in conjunction with this, okay? 
So Nature Craft said, I would be very leery to steak with superwash. I find it slippery. It what it depends on is not the slipperiness of the yarn. It's how many stitches are in your steak. Where's my steak? Here's the steak. How many stitches are in the steak? And the way that I'm going to treat these stitches before I cut it, which I'll show you, it reinforces it. But you could also sew it with a sewing machine. It's okay to do that. It's perfectly okay. Um, this is uh, the modern ages. You know, we're not doing reenactment uh, knitting, which you could. You could do reenactment knitting, reenactment. But I like to use all the skills of the past and all of the available technology of the current time in my knitting. And I do know all the skills of the past so that I know how I can maintain a um, integrity in my knitting. Okay. So let's see if there's any more questions. Our time's doing really good. So I don't see any more questions. It looks like we're just about done. I don't have any new knitting to show you other than my swatch, which I'm, I'm working on. I hope to finish that today. And then I'll be making that video. And I also did the video earlier today on the measuring your body for the new sweater. So that's going to be fun. And that'll probably come out um, after Friday. You know, the new sweater is going to be the, the half price day is Friday. And you'll get a little thing about making a, uh, if you want to try stranded knitting. Just if you want to try it, you're going to get a little design thing to do a wristlet so you can practice doing a steak and stuff. Um, but this Friday is just going to be the half price day. And then between the 15th, Friday's the 15th, and the 1st of March, I will be sending out some supplemental information for the people who bought it so that you can start thinking about the yarn you want to use. You can start swatching. Um, you can start measuring your gauge. I'll send out um, just some supplemental information, just like we did last time to make it fun and interesting. Then the, on the 1st, we'll start seriously on our gauge, and then we'll start on our schematic. So we'll have our swatch, we'll do our measurements, create our schematic, and then we're going to calculate how much yarn we need. And I'll have that calculator again, Ron, uh, from my local yarn store. He'll, I'm sure he'll make a little calculator where you can just plug in your numbers from your um, schematic. And it'll spit out how much yarn you need, including 100 extra grams for swatching. Okay. Oh. Oh, Vanita Ann says there's one question left of Vanita. Vanita, did I miss you? Let me look. Thank you, Ann. Let me look, Vanita. I missed a question. Okay, Vanita, she says, can you add the zipper in a cardigan without adding a button band? Isn't an I-cord edge instead? Yes, you can. You can do that. An I-cord edge would look really good over a zipper because it would curve around and help cover up the zipper. On the same uh, um, tact is so... We didn't plan to do an I-cord edge for this particular cardigan. So in the I-tag cardigan that we just finished, we planned for a three-inch wide band down the front. All of our measurements and everything were based upon that three-inch wide band. So you can't really use an I-cord for that unless your sweater is really too big for you, and then you could use just an I-cord. But in any other sweater, if you plan it from the beginning, that that's the edging you're going to have. Yes, you could do that for a zipper. That's a great question. I really appreciate you uh, adding that in there. So, you know, a lot of the things that I'm taught teaching you is actually called finishing. And you notice we do it actually before we start knitting. So if you want to plan an I-cord edging for a zipper, you need to plan that before you start knitting. Okay? It should be called finishing before you start knitting or the beginning or something like that. Finishing is misleading. It makes you, it makes it sound like you do something you do when the sweater is finished and the last final details are finishing, but that is not true. Okay. Let's see if anybody else has added anything. 
Oh, what a grand idea. Okay, Deborah Cisneros says, Suzanne, here's the name for your live stream. Suzanne Off the Cuff. I actually kind of like that. I kind of like that. I might change it to that. I'm going to write that down. Suzanne Off the Cuff. Thank you. That's awesome. Then, <coughs> excuse me. Okay. Let's see where we are. Andrew Mollier says, schematic and finishings are the boss. Yes, exactly. Knowing it's like, you know, I when I used to work as a physician's assistant, uh, and people came in and they had something they needed to work on. Let's say they wanted to work on quitting smoking or they wanted to work on losing weight or something like that. I would tell them, this is a little story I would use. I would say, if you want to drive from here to New York City or you know somewhere that's clear across the United States from where I am, would you just get in your car and start driving? Would you just get in and say, oh, Look at that. That's beautiful over there. I think I'll go see that and drive over there. And they say, oh, look at that and drive over there. And, and by being distracted and just looking at what you want to see and what you want to do, would you ever get to New York City? No. You need a map and a plan. And so you sit and you plan it out and you figure out where, how far you can get in a day and where you need to spend the night and how long it's going to take you and how much money it's going to cost and you do all that kind of stuff. It's the same thing when you're trying to change a lifestyle. You have to make a plan and then you follow your plan. Knitting's the same way. When you want to design a sweater from scratch, you have to make a plan, which is what I'm teaching you, and then follow your plan. So uh, that's the finishing. You, you plan it in advance. Okay. Then somebody else said something up here. It was, um, it was Champ Smith. She said, I took a class at Vogue Knitting Live with Ann Weaver, and she uses thrift store sweaters to make steaks. Yes, you can just buy them and cut them. You can practice reinforcing the stitches and cutting them and seeing what happens to the yarn. Very cool. That's such a great idea. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. And Manita said she's planning her second sweater where she wants to add the zipper. Yes, yeah, so you could just plan for that, um, um, the I-cord edging. That would be perfect. Vanita says, sorry, the 200 character limit makes the questions very cryptic and difficult to clarify. I'm sorry, but we, we, you guys are doing really, really good. Okay. Yes, and Nature Craft says you also need gas in your car and make sure it's been maintained so you don't run out of gas in the middle of nowhere. Exactly. So it's just having a plan. Um, and then you can do stuff, you know, if you have a plan and you plan that you can have these little side excursions, which are swatching, you know, how we get to the button band and before we do the button band, we swatch our buttonholes to test to see which ones we like and what they look like in our yarn and if they'll fit our buttons. Those are the little side excursions. That's when you go to a museum, you know, because you just happen to be close to it. Okay, so I think, oh, here's Deborah Cisneros. Question, can I purchase the pattern this week if I won't be able to knit along at this time? Yes, it's gonna be 1250 for for one uh, 24 hour period on the 15th of February, $12.50. That seems like a lot, but you're going to get so much value from this, just from the education. It is like taking a semester class. Um, so it's, it's pretty inexpensive. What makes it worth my while in doing this is that so many people purchase it that it is worth my while to go through all this effort and to teach you, to make the videos, to do the written tutorials and all that kind of stuff. So I learn from you and you learn from me and it's a give take sort of thing. So $12.50 this Friday. After that, it's $25. So I'm going to let you go because I have to go have my mammogram today. And it's just routine screening. I don't have anything wrong with me yet. So um, I'll see you next time. Now, I want to tell you 
this Sunday there will be no live stream because my husband and I have tickets to a play that we're going to go see. It's a Sunday matinee and I really want to see it. So we're going to skip this week. Then I will be here next Wednesday, hopefully with Charles. The following Sunday is Stitches West in Santa Clara. And at two o'clock in the afternoon, I'll actually be in the car driving home from Stitches West. So I won't be live streaming next Sunday either. So those dates are, let me tell you the dates. Let me bring up my calendar here real quick. On uh, February, the, uh, tw February the 16th, no, I'm sorry, February the 17th and the 24th, I will not, of 2019, I will not be live streaming, but I will be doing the Wednesdays in between. So I'm going to say goodbye. And, um, and let you go. Now, Alma Ross says, hi, I came in about halfway through. Will this be available for replay? Where will I find it on YouTube and when? It will be on my YouTube channel and it's available like about an hour after uh, I close off. It takes them a little time to put it on there, but it'll be in my most current video list. And um, um, Diana Danko does the live streams for me. Thank you, Diana. And she does the timestamps. So in about 24 hours, I'll get the timestamps from her and then I'll put them below. So when you look at the description below the video, there'll be all the timestamps. So you can go right to, and if you just click on them, it takes you to that part of the video. It's very, very cool. All the books that I talked about will be listed down there. If I said any references to videos or anything, I'll have links down there. So it's easy access for you. So my knitting channel is called Knitting with Suzanne. I mean, is it Knitting with Suzanne Bryan? I think it is. Yes, Knitting with Suzanne Bryan. Just go to YouTube, look for Knitting with Suzanne Bryan. It'll come up. And um, this particular one should be the most recent one until I make another new video. And then it'll be the second one down. So it should be easy to find. So I hope you all have a really good day. I hope you subscribe to my YouTube channel. You know, um, I get a lot of views from people that are not subscribers yet. So YouTube puts a lot of value on how many subscribers a videographer has. And that's how they kind of rank you in their system is by the number of subscribers you have, not by the number of views. I have right now, I have, I think like 37,000 subscribers and, and I'm coming up on 4 million views. At 100,000 subscribers, they give you a lot more um, uh, promotion from YouTube. So, and that's what I'm striving for. And so that it's meaningful to me. If you like watching my live streams or my videos, pay me back by subscribing to my YouTube channel. Okay. So we'll see you next time. Happy knitting and have a lot of fun until I see you next. Bye-bye.